Verse 1. There are in the church two priesthoods, namely the Melchizedek and Aaronic, including the Levitical priesthood. Just really quickly, remember the twelve tribes of Israel? <clears throat> One of the tribes was Levi. He was the third son of Jacob, name changed to Israel. So Levi, then 400 years down the road, has a descendant named Aaron, brother of Moses, who is Moses's Moses and Miriam's brother, and Aaron then becomes the the father of all of these priests in the Old Testament. So the priesthood line comes through that tribe, the Levitical priesthood, Levi or Aaronic priesthood. Aaron, his descendant, we call it today the Aaronic, just so you understand the wording here. And then the other one, the higher priest is called the Melchizedek. Why? He's this great high priest. By the way, his name is fascinating in Hebrew, Melchizedek. Yeah, so in Hebrew, uh, the word melech means king. It's a very interesting word. And the word zedek or sadok, actually even in Arabic today, if you say sadiq, it actually means like a very close friend, but it actually means righteous, even loyal. And this little I in here kind of combines these two Hebrew words together that one of the potential meanings of Melchizedek is king of righteousness. We actually might add this in here because um, in the ancient world, sometimes words were meant for both men or women. So king or queen of righteousness. If you think about the temple and really overall the work of God, he wants us to become kings and queens of righteousness. So embedded in the meaning of Melchizedek is the whole purpose of what God's priesthood is all about. It's to help us become like our heavenly parents, kings and queens of righteousness. So at any point you ever heard the word Melchizedek, just remind yourself, oh yeah, that's a prompt for me to remember this is my goal that I am striving for to be like my heavenly parents. It's beautiful, beautiful. Verse 3, before his day, so keep in mind, Melchizedek lived in Abraham's time period. Abraham is actually going to pay tithing to Melchizedek. Uh, verse 3, before his day, it was called the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. That's a long name, but out of respect or reverence to the name of the supreme being to avoid the too frequent repetition of his name, they, the church in ancient days, called that priesthood after Melchizedek, or the Melchizedek priesthood. So now you understand the, the why we call it that rather than its original name, which is fascinating because the original name has this beautiful concept. It's the holy priesthood, and by the way, the word hood, so priesthood. So if you look up in the Oxford English Dictionary in the etymology of the suffix hood, where it comes from, it's a condition or a quality. It's this um, like a state of being. State of being. Mm -hmm. So fascinating. Priesthood. It's a state. It's you're taking something upon you. It's this state of becoming a priest or to have priestly power and perform priestly functions. What's also interesting, Tyler, here is the use of the word order. Well, what's the opposite of order? It's disorder. Chaos. And if you think about creation, Genesis 1, what does God do? He actually brings order to where there was chaos or disorder. Everything has a place and a purpose. So we have this word order, and there's another word that we often use in the church, and it's ordinances. Ordinances are how we provide order. We have the ordinance or the order of baptism, which is provided through the power of the priesthood. We have the order or the ordinance of marriage or temple covenants, and one that we see every week is the order or the ordinance of remembering the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We call that the sacrament. So the priesthood is a way to provide order and direction and guidance in our lives 
And whenever you see the rituals of the church or the ordinances, it's an invitation to remind all of us that God is a God of order. And when we participate in that order, we also can have a fullness of his love and his power. Beautiful. Now, he, he gets into some of the specifics. So you'll notice you have verse 9. The presidency of the high priesthood have a right to officiate in all the offices of the church. Keep in mind it's a hierarchy. It's ordered. There's, there's a reason for this order in, a, in an organization that eventually is going to fill the whole world, according to Joseph's prophecies. So then you go from the presidency of the high priesthood, that's the first presidency, verse 10, high priests have the right to officiate in their own standing under the direction of the, the presidency. Look at verse 11, an elder has the right to officiate. So then we get down to the priesthood of Aaron in verse 13, and why is it called the lesser priesthood? He answers that question in verse 14, because it's an appendage to the greater or the Melchizedek priesthood has power in administering outward ordinances, like baptism. That's why you get John the Baptist, who, who is this priest who's ordained when he's very young, and he's given the, the authority to baptize. It's fascinating that he's the one that the Lord uh, assigned to restore that power in the latter days to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, is John the Baptist, that power to baptize, that Aaronic priesthood that he held. Then you get um, verse 18, the power and authority of the higher or Melchizedek priesthood is to hold the keys of all the spiritual blessings of the church. So we unlock doors, we let people into, into temples and into covenants and connections with God in this hierarchical uh, order of the church, how it's set up through those keys of the higher priesthood. Verse uh, 20, the power and authority of the lesser or the Aaronic priesthood is to hold the keys of the ministering of angels and to administer in the outward ordinances, the letter of the gospel, including baptism and some of these other things we've been talking about. Now, very quickly, it, it might be helpful to just very um, succinctly see these various offices. So what you have in the Aaronic priesthood side is you have four offices. The bishop who presides over the Aaronic priesthood, and the bishopric is the presidency of the Aaronic priesthood in a ward, and then you have priests, you have teachers, and you have deacons. Now, we were introduced to these offices back in section 20, but here you get more clarification and more description. And it's interesting that up until about 1908, these offices were given to adult men, and under the presidency of Joseph F. Smith, beginning around 1908 and continuing on through about 1922, there were some adjustments to um, who was invited into these priesthood offices, and now many of us are familiar with deacons beginning around 12 or in their 12th year, teachers in their 14th year, priests in their 16th year. So these, these changes only happen in the last 100 years, and the point here is that there's ongoing revelation. God never originally said in here, like, what's the specific, specific age, but to Joseph F. Smith, back in 1908 and further on, he God gave some further clarification about inviting the young men who are growing up in the, in the priesthood offices these different opportunities. So the bishop being the presiding high priest over that Aaronic priesthood set of quorums, some people are perplexed by the fact that for the first set of decades these are mostly grown men, and then, like you said, Joseph Smith changing it, and then for many of us, it was very simple. At age 12, age 14, and age 16, that's when a transition occurred, or the ordination occurred. But then more recently, the Handbook of Instructions tells us that in January of the year that a young man is going to turn 12, so many, most of the time, it's 11-year-olds, and 13-year-olds, and 15-year-olds, 
And some would say, well, why the change? I wonder, I wonder if there's incredible power in something like section 107, where it lays out these principles, these offices, without being highly prescriptive to this level, which then means that God can continue to guide a living, breathing, adapting, growing church to meet the needs of the world in which we live and the, the rising generations, how to, how to best bless them. So rather than seeing this as a frustration, I, this to me, I love the fact that God lays out section 107 in 1835 and these offices in both the Aaronic and the Melchizedek priesthood side, the offices have not changed in all these years since 1835, but we've adapted the use of those offices and how they're applied so that we can meet the needs of a growing global church. So we have the offices of the Melchizedek priesthood, which are apostle, you have 70, you have patriarch, you have high priest, and elder. Now notice how beautifully this is set up, and then later on you get where he describes in verse 64 through 66 the presiding apostle, the president of the high priesthood becomes the leader, he is the president of the church, and we sustain all of the members of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles as prophets, seers, and revelators, but there is one who, pre who holds all the keys um, for the work at one time. Now, check this out. We have the 70 who are called here in section 107, and for years after this initial group is called, they're, they're called to be special witnesses, kind of like the apostles, but their call is specifically to go out to the Gentiles and preach the gospel as special witnesses of Christ in section 107. And then we come into this period of the church for decades and decades where collectively as a church we don't really know what to do with the 70. And so up until President Spencer W. Kimball as the prophet, we have 70s who are called and ordained to the office of a 70 at the stake level, and they're basically functioning as stake missionaries. That's what they do. So you had elders quorum, 70s quorum, and high priest quorum, or the high priest group in a ward, because the high priest quorum belongs to the stake and the groups belong to the wards or the branches. But we didn't know what to do with the 70 until President Kimball's ministry as the prophet, as the president of the church, where the Lord revealed, oh, this is actually uh, how the 70 are intended to be used now moving forward. That's not to say that all previous prophets had it wrong. That's the beautiful thing. We don't have to we don't have to pit current prophets against past prophets and say only one of them can be right. The way these principles are laid out in section 107 is it was perfectly fine for them to use the 70 in a stake missionary assignment for all those years, all those decades. But then when the need arose with a growing global church, God gave the revelation, no, this is going to be a general authority position now. Because previous to this, you have the First Presidency and you have the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles and then you had assistance to the Twelve. We didn't have 70 until we now create that particular manifestation of the principles in section 107 to say we're going to call um, these 70s to be general authorities under the direction of the Twelve Apostles to help carry the work further into the world. Well, since that time, President Hinckley then, in his uh, prophetic ministry, has it revealed that, wait a minute, section 107 verse 96 tells us also other 70 can be called until seven times 70. 
So we can have multiple quorums of 70. It doesn't just need to be the quorum of the 70. We can have two quorums, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And the number has continually grown. Why? Because the work of the Lord has continued to grow in all the world. And so we have some of those quorums that are general authority 70s, and then we have others of those quorums of 70 that are area authority 70s. So they're their rights to administer the directions given to them from the First Presidency, the Quorum of the Twelve, and the Seven Presidents of the Seventy, and area presidencies are now given to the area authorities to help work with those local stake presidents and local leadership within a geographic area. And when that area authority leaves that particular area, he no longer has any authority. It's a house of order. And, and a neighboring bishop doesn't come to your ward and tell you what revelation the Lord has, has given him for your ward, just like a neighboring area authority doesn't go to a different part of the world and have any authority to, to administer the ordinances or proclaim the gospel because there are area authorities there, whereas there are general authority 70s who have general authority over the whole world, and so that helps us um, keep it a house of order. Are you noticing the beauty of this organizational structure, this setup? All of these things that you're going to read in section 107, the various priesthood offices and who presides over the different groups and what that role is, how it's this foundational organization in a hierarchical church that is both solid and steadfast and immovable, but at the same time extremely adaptable to the needs of the world around us. That's why we can call it a living, breathing, growing church, is because it's not, it's not stuck in 1835. We're not held hostage by the setting and the cultural um, surroundings of the church members in 1835. It's ingenious, and only a god sets things up this way. This is not the, – the principles in section 107, whether they be for the hierarchical church or for the home manifestations of priesthood power, this is not something that, that men and women come up with. Uh, this is given to us as heaven sharing a little bit of, of their power with us to be able to do things that help us grow to become more like them. And the more we are faithful in that, the more power they give us and the more opportunities we have to bless lives and to chase darkness from among us and to shine light in dark corners of people's lives and move forward.